Okay, so now we're going to turn our attention to transposition or transposon, those jumpable genes that we've mentioned before. Okay, so first I'll start by noting that this is Barbara, Barbara McClintock, and in the early 1950s, her work with corn plants actually helped to identify transposons. So make sure you write that down. We're adding to our history here. So Barbara McClintock, 1950s, corn plants, transposable elements. So because this topic is new, I tried to provide an outline that I'll keep referring to so you know what we're talking about. So I'll start with two pathways that transposable elements use to move around the genome. Then we'll talk about the characteristics of transposable elements as well as enzymes that are necessary for them to work. We'll talk about four types of transposable elements and the DNA patterns in the chromosomes that they need to be able to move around the transposition process, so there are two processes, and then what is the biological importance of them, okay? So if you are ready to start, we're gonna go ahead with the pathways. So two pathways, simple transposition. So here, TE throughout this lecture will refer to transposable elements. So in this simple transposition, a transposable element moves from one site to another. It's like cut and paste. So I'm gonna take it out of chromosome one and stick it in chromosome two. And these are transposons, okay? So transposons do simple. So here we are in our original site. We're gonna come along, cut this out, and then move it somewhere else. And that's simple transposition. Then we have retro transposition. And this should look very familiar to you and it should put you in the mindset of retroviruses. So now we have a transposable element, a retrotransposable element that's in our DNA. It's going to be made into an RNA. We don't necessarily have to remove it. We just have to read the message. So we're going to transcribe this from DNA to RNA. This RNA is then going to be converted back into DNA by reverse transcriptase and then stuck somewhere else. So if you look here, we had one. We still had one more. Here we had one. Now we have two. So this is an easier process for inserting these transposons back into our genome, okay? So those are the two pathways, so simple and retro. Now, what are, what are these TEs? So transposable elements can be autonomous or non-autonomous. If they are autonomous, that means they are complete as is. They have everything that they need to function. So that means they have enzymes that allow them to do transposition. If they are not autonomous, they're incomplete. They don't have everything they need. So they're going to have to either be near something that does so that they can take advantage of it, or they're just stuck in place. And so what is it that they need? They need these enzymes. So there's transposase. So transposase is an enzyme that catalyzes the removal of a transposon from one site to another. Reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that takes the RNA transcript and makes a DNA. Integrase cuts that new DNA made from reverse transcriptase at the ends of the target site, and then they put that TE back in that site, okay? And then endonuclease is an enzyme that cuts DNA in the middle. So that's the endo, because there are some that are exo that cuts the ends, okay? So these are what's necessary for us to have transposition. If a cell or if an element carries these, they're considered autonomous. If they lack any of these that they need, they're non-autonomous. All right, you with me so far? So let's talk about the types of them. So the first one is every transposable element. So regardless of if it's retro or not, they have to have these direct repeats, also called target site duplications. So these are identical nucleotide sequences on the end that are in the same direction and repeated. A, T, G, C, A, A, T, G, C, A, okay? So those are direct repeats and they flank or they're on both sides of our transposon. So all transposable elements have these direct repeats. Next one, okay, so the first type is called an insertion element. Insertion elements, you see these direct repeats, but they also have inverted repeats on each side. Now, depending on the organism and the element, these can be 9 to 40 base pairs in length. 
And so these are direct repeats, then the inverted repeats. And here's an example of what they will look like. So here you have CTG, CTG, okay? So it's like the mirror image on the opposite side. They may encode transposase because they need transposase in order to come out and go somewhere else. So if it's an insertion element, it has the direct repeat, it has an inverted repeat, and it usually has transposase. Then we have simple transposons. These are like insertion elements, but they can also carry genes. So a simple transposon has a direct repeat, has an inverted repeat, has transposase, and it has another gene. And both of those are capable of simple transposition. Now we're going to move into our retro transposons. So LTR stands for long terminal repeats. And now these re LTR retro transposons have these long terminal repeats that flank either side of them. So they have the direct repeats, then they have these long terminal repeats. They're related to retroviruses. So what does that mean? They move around the genome, they encode reverse transcriptase and integrase. And if you think back to our lesson on viral genetics, we talked about retroviruses, specifically HIV, how it not only has the DNA surrounded by protein, but it also comes with integrase and reverse transcriptase because they're not normally found inside of the human genome. So these ones have the ability to encode for those two. And so they're going to move by retro transposition. So they have a direct repeat, they have the long terminal repeats, they have reverse transcriptase and integrase. Then we have our non-LTL retro transposons. So these are thought to be from normal eukaryotic genes. And so an example is this ALU fam family of repetitive sequences in people. So we are up to about 1 million copies in the human. So they may have this gene that's reverse transcriptase plus an endonuclease in one. So they have the direct repeat, then they are the sequence, the transposon, and it encodes reverse transcriptase and endonuclease. They don't have another sequence that's flanking the sides of it. Okay, so those are our types. So we had an uh, inverted element, simple transposon, LTR reverse transposon, and a non-LTR transposon, okay? So let's talk about how they do what they do. So here we have simple transposition. We have a transposable element. We have it flanked by its inverted repeats. So this transposase is going to recognize those inverted repeats and bind to them in a monomer state or a subunit. Then those two subunits come together or dimerize. And when they do that, they are physically moving and causing the transposable element to loop out, as you see here. Okay. Then this transposase is going to cut on the outside of those inverted repeats. So you see my pink arrows here? It's going to cut that DNA. And that's going to excise that transposon. So now we have our excised transposon that has transposase, where it goes somewhere else, and transposase is going to cut into that new sequence and allow the transposon to be inserted there, okay? So we have inverted repeats that are recognized by transposase monomers. Those two monomers come together to form a dimer, and in doing so, it causes a loop in this chromosome, and it loops out the transposon. Then it cleaves it. It cuts it out, and then it goes somewhere else and cut. Now, where it goes to cut, it gives these staggering sites. So here you see it's cutting here and it's going to leave these staggers. Now, when it does that, it puts in the transposable element. These stagger sites, because they were together, are complementary. So when our DNA repair mechanism comes in and fills in the blank, we now have direct repeats. And we know a characteristic of our transposable elements is direct repeats. So we have our direct repeats that they were there. We just found a way to turn it into what we needed by giving a staggering cut. We're carrying with us an inverted region and we're carrying with us our transposable element. Now, this can increase the number of copies. So even though what we looked at and we've seen in retro, it can increase, but simple can increase as well. 
So simple increases because this process usually occurs around DNA replication. And so DNA replication is going to replicate this transposable element because it's found in the genome. But depending on when this element comes out and goes somewhere else, it can be replicated again. So we have this region here that has not yet been replicated and everything else was. So if it comes out and goes to a region that still has yet to be replicated, now we're going to have a chromosome that has one and a chromosome that has two. So let's go through that again. We have our DNA sequence. We have a transposable element that was already replicated. It comes out and inserts itself in the DNA again. Now it's going to be replicated again and ultimately have two copies instead of one. And now retrotransposition, you have the DNA sequence. It's transcribed. When it's transcribed into that RNA, that RNA is then going to be reverse transcribed back to DNA by reverse transcriptase, and then integrase is going to go and make staggering cuts and insert that DNA elsewhere within a chromosome. This, because it's through transcription, we can make many copies of it. So we can have this as if it was a regular gene, however many copies we need. So we can be making four, five, or six mRNAs, or we can make four and five and six proteins from one mRNA, depending on how this process works, and just keep integrating it in. And so this is easy to see how this one can cause multiple copies. Now, why, though? Why do we do this? Why does this exist? The question is, we really don't know. So we do know that there are many different genes, or not genes, organisms that contain transposable elements in different kinds. We have transposons in bacteria. We have retrotransposons in yeast, transposons in Drosophila, retro in humans, and regular or simple in plants. And we know insertion elements, we know how many copies, we know the size of it. And I'll note here that this AC is autonomous and DS is non-autonomous in plants. We know the abundance. So 77% of the genome in frogs is made up of transposable elements as compared to 0.3 in bacteria. So what does this tell you? Complex organisms or eukaryotes tend to have more than prokaryotes. So four in yeast, now they are eukaryotes, but they are simpler. In humans, we're at about 45%. Does that mean that frogs are more, more complex than us? Hmm. So what are they doing? So one hypothesis, and this is going to be like the debate on yeast is that it's a selfish DNA. They exist because they can. They exist because they have characteristics that allow them to multiply and insert themselves. They don't really give a selective advantage to the host or the organism that they're in, and they can proliferate as long as they don't harm the host or cause death. So they are there because they can be. Another is that, hey, no, these things are deleterious, and they would be eliminated through natural selection, except for they have some kind of advantage that they confer. So what's that advantage? One is this greater genetic variability. So by having multiple copies of these, it allows for recombination, so they keep on going. In bacteria, they can carry genes. So remember, the simple transposon can have a gene with it, and it can be this antibiotic resistance that bacteria need. So because it can do that, they're able to survive. Another idea is this exon shuffling so that they carry with them an exon from one gene and they put it into a new gene. And by doing so, they create a new protein which has a new function. So it's giving an advantage to the genome that it's in. And then there are some consequences that's not so good. So they can cause breakage and rearrangements, mm. mutations, duplications, a whole bunch of things can happen. So these tend to be rare events, but they can occur. And sometimes they occur when stuff happens in the genome. So if there's radiation, mutagens, hormone stimulation, and things cause them to move. And when they do, we can have any of these effects. So this has to be a carefully regulated process, or we know it can be detrimental. Okay, so I hope this was an okay explanation and that you have an idea of what it is. And you might want to listen to this twice because I understand this is new information. 
slow it down when I was going over it, replay it, write it down, take notes, come to class for questions. I'll be happy to talk about it.